So I felt yesterday, as I was introducing the Vedanta Sutra to you, this is quite a new subject for normal class. But because I got this book, this is on my own study list. So I just took advantage and uh, gave a little, a little insight. But in order to get a little bit more complete, I have to read a little bit more to you, so you really get an introduction of what the Vedanta Sutra stands for. The first and last court of appeal in the Vedanta philosophy is Anubhava, experience. With experience it begins and with experience it ends. Experience is synonymous with reality, which is to be analyzed, synthesized, and plunged into, so that its ultimate nature may be immediately apprehended. What is experience? Experience is consciousness. Chaitanya. Answered the Vedantist. The two are identical. I experience means I am conscious. Conscious is in the language of Kant, the lawgiver of nature. For the Vedantist, it is consciousness that makes experience. Experience goes to pieces without consciousness. The essential factor that makes experience what it is and without which it is next to nothing is consciousness. Consciousness, therefore, is the essence of all reality. And this is so amazing, you know. Actually, philosophy is beautiful. When we hear about philosophy, we don't know what philosophy really means. We, we brush it aside as something like, oh, this is too complicated for me. But when we approach the study of philosophy under the guardian of Vedanta, it becomes the most exciting adventure. And here it starts right, plunging into the world of consciousness. Well, what else are you going to do? Are you just going to put a finger inside? Plunging into means all body. Uh, sometimes you go to a water, warm, cold, or whatever, and you hold in the finger. Uh, 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 not for me. Uh, but when it comes to the to the bath of consciousness, there no fingering. You gotta plunge into it. That's anubhava. This is experience. This is what it is all about. Only in experience can you uh, grow. So what is this experience? Consciousness is reality. Since reality to a Vedantis is that which cannot be denied. Consciousness is just that. It is, its very denial presupposes its existence, its essence in the language of Spinoza, involves existence. Shankaracharya says, the essence of Brahman, absolute reality, is known on the ground of its being the self of everyone. For everyone is conscious of the existence of his self and never thinks, I am not. If the existence of the self was not known, everyone would think, I am not. So here we are really going into the little impersonalistic interpretation, no? Uh, it's very abstract. Impersonal philosophy is very abstract. It's supposed to come from nothing into everything and then returns to merge into nothing. No hint given. And you know what they call it? They call it Leela. It's the Leela of the Jiva to come out of the indistinct Brahman, make a journey through the samsara until it finally decides enough of that nonsense, let's go back to my indistinct uh, uh, substan substantic existence. So this is what Shankara says. 
It cannot be denied since the denier himself is that consciousness. That's a very beautiful. Atheism is a joke. Because an atheist, he has to give explanation where consciousness comes from. He cannot. So he has to accept there's something above me which made me conscious. And he says, no, consciousness arose out of accident, out of nothingness. No consciousness is nothingness. No consciousness is abstract to the maximum. How can we conceive of it? Hmm? There's a saying which Srila uh, Bhaktivedakak Shilamaj used to say. He said uh, that consciousness, no, uh, life without consciousness is meaningless. So, we are talking about God consciousness. Existence is made meaningful by our own consciousness. So we have to become conscious of our identity, of our sambanda, of our relationship. What is our relationship with reality? What is our relationship with illusion? What is what we want to plunge ourselves into? So he goes on. Experience without consciousness is for the Vedantist a meaningless term. He would contend that in order to be something existent, manifold of sensation or a thing in itself or something unknown and unknowable or even nothing that wait that what it is questioned must be the object of some awareness. However paradoxical this may appear, there is an eternal connection between myself and the world, because this world has its other side in my consciousness. Is if if there were it there were no if there were no consciousness being and no supreme consciousness at its source and center. There could not be a world. Now here we are going right into Vedanta. This is the Vedanta logic. No? This quotation comes from none else than Rabindranath Tagore, called personality. So Rabindranath Tagore says this very beautiful thing. He says, uh, there is an eternal connection between myself and the world because this world has its other side in my consciousness. If there were no conscious being and no supreme consciousness at its source, etc., there could not be a world. Now that's philosophical logic, no? <laughs> Very interesting that there couldn't be a world if I would be conscious. And if I would be consciousness, there would be no world. Very good, no? Hmm? What's the use of a world if you're not conscious of it? Consciousness in itself is our world, our duty, our responsibility. If a father is not conscious that he has a child, he doesn't assume the father role. Hmm? As soon as he's told by the woman, I'm pregnant from you, he goes, oh God, my life is changing. Now I'm a father. And all, it all goes inside him. He starts winding up. Oh my God, I'm a father. I'm a father now. I have children. But I, they, they, they're going to be very small. It's going to depend on me. Oh. So it's a, uh, for the mother, it's an almost more natural thing because she knows that what happened in her belly has something to do with her, no? She, so it gets the news that she's pregnant. Well, she knows. I invited that. I gave it a chance to happen. So, so in this case, uh, everything is about consciousness, about anubhav. Everything is about experience. As a father, is a conscious of becoming a father once he's informed that he's going to be a father in the same way 
uh, we are informed that we are being maintained, that we have a relationship with the Absolute. We, we also start uh, becoming aware of what that means for us. Everything can be, be denied save consciousness. Hmm? How can you deny consciousness? I don't believe that I am conscious. Very nice, you fool. Huh? If you cannot believe that you are conscious, then why are you talking? Hmm? The famous statements of Descartes, cogito ergo sum, indeed expresses a deep truth. It requires consciousness to doubt or deny consciousness and hence it is undeniable. Okay, very nice Mr. Descartes. Co cogito ergo sum. Hmm? Hmm, beautiful, no? It requires consciousness to doubt or deny consciousness, hence it is undeniable. The very, this is a sutra. Vedanta Sutra means say a lot with very few words. Don't use too many expensive words, but just keep to the subject. Say what has to be said, okay? And then act upon it. That means you be a Brahman. The very essence of reality, therefore, is consciousness. A short dialogue between two philosophers of the Upanishads illustrates this position of the Vedantists very clearly. King Janaka asked Yajnavalka, what was the light of man? Yajnavalka first said that the light of man was the sun. It is on account of the sun that man is able to sit and move about, to go forth for work and return. When the sun has set, O Yajnavalka asked King Janaka, what is the light of man? Yajnavalka said that then the moon was the light of man. For having the moon for light of man could sit and move about and do this work and return. When both the sun and the moon have said, asked King Janaka, that is uh, the new moon, what is the light of man? Fire indeed, said Yajnavalka, it's man's light. For having fire, for his light, man can sit and move about, do his work and return. When the sun is set, when the moon is set, and when the fire is extinguished, what is the light of man? asked Janaka Rishi. Now verily, says Yajnavalka, you are pressing me to the deepest question. When the sun is set, when the moon is set, and when the fire is extinguished, the self alone is man's light. Beautiful, no? Upanishads, they are beautiful. I mean, come on. Uh, who, who gives such an explanation, no? And sun is already divine. Moon is divine. Fire is Agni. All the fires, everything which gives light is ignited by the original consciousness. So you cannot get away from the divine. Even when you are supposedly mooning, moving in the mundane, it's also not mundane. But finally he says, only yourself, your conscious self, that is the light you have. Jeho, Jaisinate. And what is that? That is very closely connected to Kshinuta Kashai Vishnu or Sri Paramatma, who resides in our heart, in our consciousness of consciousness, and is our internal advisor. You know, we're talking about consciousness. Why not talking about super consciousness? Why not talking about information given to you from sites which you don't know about or you don't expect any answer? And that is the, the birth of Guru Tattva is coming here. Consciousness, and that alone is real. Consciousness, Chaitanya, is identical with existence, Sat. So, existence without consciousness would be meaningless. 
So therefore, sat is consciousness. The whole of existence is conscious and the unity is called bliss. So ananda. So we have chit, consciousness, sat, chit. Chit also means awareness. And ananda is bliss. So the, the saying goes, without consciousness, existence would be meaningless. And without ecstasy, consciousness would be a perpetual torture. If you're just existing and you never find any good reason for that, no, nothing to be happy around, just existing for nothing or so to say, then that consciousness would be a perpetual torture. My consciousness and the vast world outside of me are one. And where is that unity? Is it that great power who breathes our consciousness in me and also in the world outside myself? How consciousness can be the whole of existence and what their identity means we shall grasp fully when we have acquainted ourselves with consciousness in all its dimensions. Consciousness has four dimensions in Vedanta philosophy and when it has all of them it is said to be full and blissful. To these four dimensions of consciousness we now turn our attention. <coughs> dimensions of consciousness. First dimension, waking. Ordinarily when we think of consciousness experience we look around us at sensible objects including our own bodies. It is with this immediately perceived objects that we equate our consciousness experience and why usually we come to conclusion I'm this body. I see the body, I move the body, I feel what the body feels. So I think maybe I'm this body. It's kind of a logical way of thinking. We think of it to use a spatial metaphor as an extended plane. This is said to be the first dimension of consciousness. It is a sensible corporeal world as there are four dimensions and all the others are approached only through this. It is called the first. This is also Shankara commentary on Mandukya Upanishad. <clears throat> when we stop to analyze the moment, we discover that our percepts have hardly any meaning without concepts of ideas. In order to be conscious of a red rose, for instance, one has to borrow numerous ideas from one's earlier memories. Mere percepts give very little. Thus we begin to realize that consciousness has not only length and breadth, but depth too. To a Vedantist, consciousness is solid, so to speak, or even more than solid. A solid has three dimensions, while Vedantic consciousness has four. Psychologists tell us that mind is like an iceberg, only one ninth of what is floating on the surface. By four dimensions of Vedantists seek to encompass the whole waking consciousness, Jagrat, dreaming consciousness, Svapna, dreamless consciousness, Shushupti, and the fourth consciousness is Tuniya, so called perhaps for want of a technical term. Also, in course of time, the term force acquired a technical status. We shall capitalize these four terms in order to indicate their technical meanings. The fourth dimension, as we have already mentioned in the corporeal sensible world, which is technically called waking. Waking has its experience limited to the gross plane and its fruition, therefore consists of gross objects. It is named Vaishvanara which is collective name of all beings on the gross plane. In spite of such names as waking or dream, it should not be supposed that this is a mere psychological study of the mind. The dimensions are so named, not because they are psychological, but because 
They have been discovered through psychological analysis that they are preeminently ontological. We shall see as we proceed. Second dimension, dreaming. Too, too quick? Sorry. <clears throat> second dimension, dreaming. The second dimension is called dream consciousness. Dreams are studied by our psychologists today, usually to satisfy their curiosity about the psyche. Psychologists are not interested in the metaphysical implication of dreams. Our metaphysic metaphysicians are neg also neglect them for no good reason. And our waking consciousness does supply us with materials that enable us to philosophize. There is no reason why the dreaming and the dreamless states of our consciousness should not also do so, says a Vedantist. Dreams or dreamless, dreamless sleep are nothing abnormal. Every sane person sleeps daily. Some nights he dreams, some nights he sleeps soundly without any dream. As a matter of fact, we spend almost one third of our life in dreaming. And while dreaming, dreams are no more dreams than waking perceptions are dreams. They appear as, a, as equally real. To a Vedantist, however, these aspects of human experience reveal different dimensions of consciousness and consequently of existence. Since they are two sides of one reality, like two faces of one piece of paper, a psychologist's account of a dream is somewhat like this. When a man goes to sleep, he sees images, some of which are due to an actual in external stimulus present at the time of sleep, while others are the copies of his waking perception arising spontaneously and at random. Now let us see how a Vedantist would distinguish his dreaming states from his waking ones. Waking experience are restricted to the actual presentative elements, whereas dreams are not. Waking consciousness is directed by practical interests, whereas dreams are not. A continuously connective attention gives waking states a more definite pattern than the dream images. Free play of imagination gives the dream a wider scope and flexibility than the waking state. The connection that are contradictory and impossible in waking stage are quite commonplaces in dreams. Our practical needs of life have a very commanding voice in our waking consciousness. This is selective and gives rise to beliefs and prejudices which rule out certain associations. In waking state, certain things demand more attention than others. Certain objects we are serious about, others we pass by, and these choices are mostly determined by the biological drives of our life. In dreams, on the other hand, while our biological drive is our life, in dreams, on the other hand, while our biological demands are at their minimum, the tyranny of practical needs ceases for a moment to exercise the function of our free mind. The images find 
an unfenced field in which to play freely. Perhaps we see our own ideas, but they are not known to be our ideas. They seem to be as much given as the objects of waking life. The waking life is presented with the real given and the dream life with the belief that something is given. The real life also involves belief, but that it is more than belief and that the belief of the dream is mere belief is not known until the two beliefs are taken together and compared. Justly or not, our waking experience is regulated by a sense of uniformity, continuity and limitation of space and time. But utter discontinuity, lack of uniform, uniformity and absence of space-time refer, reference seem to characterize the dream state. To be sure the dreams do appear to take place in space and time and to possess some pattern. But what is altogether lost is their rigidity. There is no tyrannic continuous memory, no rigid demand for uniformity, no compunctions for not being in line with truth. A glorious life of thoughtless thoughtfulness. <coughs> Amazing. Such are dreams. What do they indicate to a Vedantist? Dream states signify to the Vedantist that there is the possibility of perception without sensation, since dreams are just such perceptions. What of it? We ask. Granting that it is so, what metaphysical import does it have? It suggests, answers in Vedantist, that there is a possibility of a realm of pure ideas and meanings which are not limited by impressions. There is a world of thoughts, of ideas, and their consciousness is free of externalities. This is the more intimate nature of our consciousness since here it exhibits its freedom and spontaneity. Internal perception is prior to external logically, if not chronologically. The world of sensation appears to be real to us only because it is sustained and given meaning by ideas and thoughts. The sensation is felt to give us reality only because the idea unconsciously animated it. It is perception apart from thought, experience and all? Question. Emphatically not. It is with thought, with judgment, that our knowledge truly begins. And not with mere presentation. What makes perception feel real to me is my interpretation of it. And this interpretation is preeminently an act of thought. Presentation is representative and hence though is more fundamental and basic than sense. It is this realm of free thought that constitutes the second dimension of consciousness. If we have to know reality, we have to know it more from thoughts than from sense. That is the lesson of the dream. Uh, 
as you can see, in order to be clear and analytical in philosophical thought, you need to be very precise and distinct all the way to boredom to make certain things clear. Well, I will tell you a story from my life which will show you the importance of dream in case you don't have already your own experience, which most likely you all have. Because we don't pay much attention to dreams generally, while we pay a lot of attention to thoughts about substances and dimensions. Especially we pay attention to ownership. One of the most foolish things, do you have it or don't you have it? Do you still want to buy it? Do you pay for it? What is the evidence that it is yours now? What is your security you're applying that nobody else will take it away from you? So the external world <coughs> is very, very, it captures us a lot with security measures. But in the dream world, the dream world is more creative, it is more free, and it can bring about so many amazing things. <coughs> When I was a young temple commander in Berlin, I used to be very rough with the devotees. If they would not do their duties like clean up or anything like that, so when somebody would really become very negligent and would deny to do some service, then I would look at them and say, well, if you don't want to do anything here, why don't you go back to your mother? If you think that you have nothing to do here, you're just here for enjoyment. So in this way, I was a bit feared temple commander. I guess the people were not so happy with me getting on their case. But that was the way I was doing my temple commander service, keeping people like, hey, you want to do something or you want to go back to your mother? Of course, I never said anybody to go back to their mother, but just the way of saying this. So, that was the physical world. I still remember it, it's not, a, it's not a fantasy. So then one night I was dreaming and I dreamt of Srila Prabhupada. And I was walking right behind him on the morning walk. Srila Prabhupada used to take daily morning walks. And in this morning walks many devotees tried to jump in and go out with him. So on Prabhupada's morning walk, I jumped in and walked right behind So I won't miss out if he wants to talk something. All of a sudden, Prabhupada stopped. And then he turned around and looked straight at me. And then he lifted his cane like he was going to hit me. And he said, why don't you go back to your mother? <laughs> then he put down the cane, turned around and kept walking. <laughs> now, when I woke up from this dream, I had a vivid memory of it which lasted until today. <laughs> Sometimes you wake up and the dream is kind of gone. There was nothing gone, every second of it was vividly. So I was so sad and I asked senior devotees, am I supposed to go back to my mother now after this dream? <laughs> Is that what Prabhupada wanted to tell me? <clears throat> but in my heart I knew 
Prabhupada was chastising me for being rough with the devotees and making that statement to them. So in that sense, I didn't go to my mother that time, even though I considered it and I, I cried, I was so sad. Because you're in the movement to please your spiritual master. If your spiritual master is obviously not pleased with you, then what's the use of spiritual life? What's the use of the whole thing? What you're doing? So, so I was very deeply touched by this dream. And I changed my attitude with devotees altogether. I hope I still remain changed. I never spoke harsh to them again and I never said any time ever again to anybody, why don't you go home to your mother? <coughs> and, but I suffered six months at least because I always kept thinking my guru is not pleased with me. So what am I doing? Then after six months, I had another dream of Srila Prabhupada. And in that dream, he forgave me and he said, he was speaking about preaching all over the world. At that time I was still in Germany, so I hadn't gone out, I hadn't even gone to Denmark, where was my first assignment of temple president. And that started my international uh, attempt of seva. Anyhow, coming back to the description here, the freedom of the dream even allowed my spiritual master to evaluate my physical activities in reality, bring them into the dream, give me an illuminating experience, then take it back to the physical world, then put it into action, what I learned from the stream, then after great remorse, many, many years, many months later, coming back into the dream, giving me a relief experience, which again I transported into my uh, practical world, and which keeps me preaching here until today. So, <coughs> just to show you, <coughs> how important the freedom world of dream is, what it can mean. And if we study the Vaishnavas, like Gopalbata Goswami, he was dreaming about the Lord. He was dreaming and he was seeing Pralat. Maharaj, because this was Nashinishinga Shaturdasi, and he was crying because he was worshipping shaligrams. He had some shaligrams, but he had no deity. And he wanted to make dresses and crowns for the Lord like his other peers were doing when they had their deities. So that was when the next morning he woke up and he looked into the bucket where he had the shaligrams and he found that one of the shalograms had expanded overnight into a deity. And that deity, which is even smaller than this deity we have here, but has the name of Radha Rama. Gopal Bhatta Goswami went crazy. Can you imagine you find a deity in your bucket where there were shalograms? Actually, the shalagram, which is called Damodar Shila, which is the, sh the shalagram which has a ring around by the belly because Damodara is the belly which is bound by the affection of Madhya's <coughs> shoulder. That had popped open and the two parts of the shalagram were still stuck on the back of Radha Raman. So Ra the Damodar Chila had popped open and Radha Raman had manifested out of it. So, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, he immediately called all the other Goswamis, Jiva Goswami, 
Look what happened, look what happened. And they all recognized that Radha Raman was a self-manifest deity, manifested by his own sweet will. Krishna has many funny ways of dealing. Krishna knows our conscious state, our subconscious state, our dreamless state, and he is also in charge of the Turiya state. The Turiya state of consciousness is his self-realized state of consciousness. When a person is totally absorbed in God consciousness, that becomes the Turiya state, the highest state which is identified is Nirvikalpa Samadhi and Savikalpa Samadhi. Here we are talking about Savikalpa Samadhi or the absorption in the divine relationship with the Lord. Whereas Nirvikalpa Samadhi is absorption in the divine identity as such or the divine cosmic uh, Brahman. Anyhow, Turiya state of consciousness is taking us to those yogic consciousness. But as you see the Vedanta Sutra is starting its evaluation of existence by analyzing Chaitanya. Chaitanya is not Lord Chaitanya, he is also the Divine Consciousness personified, but Chaitanya means consciousness in itself. So, being conscious, being Chaitanya, is our very clue in our pursuit of spirituality. It is when we come to conclude that our physical interaction with the sensual world is not producing the necessary satisfaction which our soul is longing for that we turn to yoga. That is when yoga becomes for us a very important part of our life. Hopefully the most important part. It is because the physical world experience is showing to us that my consciousness is not getting its fulfillment in those dimensions of matter. Then we want to know what is matter and what is consciousness. And then, my dear, I recommend to you not to go to university <laughs> because they don't know what is the difference between matter and consciousness. They have an entire huge array of subjects, always increasing subjects of studying matter and all its different functions and faculties and binary codes and whatever they we can talk a long time about matter because even in the world of matter Vedas have given the clue of understanding matter to a certain degree especially by giving the zero for the mathematic With, without the zero you cannot make any mathematical calculation, practically speaking. So, but that lack of satisfaction produced in the world of matter, in the world of illusion. Some people like Mr. Trump, he has so many properties, I'm sure he doesn't know where they are all. There are so many buildings and so many things, you know, so they are all out of his sight, but they all mean some paper. And before you know it, there's no more, no more Mr. Trump, 
and all this illusion is gone. But now we think he's one of the richest men. <coughs> And as the president of the U.S., he's probably going to become much richer also. They have a saying which says, the virtue of savings. Thank you. So, all is apparent conditions of matter, they are not satisfying to the self. Of course, we know that, we have talked about that one million times. Maybe you have heard about uh, the, the monk who gave away his Ferrari and became uh, a transcendentalist. In India we have so many stories like that. And uh, so, what is this really pointing to? It's, is it pointing to the dream state? No. But it gives full recognition to the dream state. And if we study the Vaishnava history, we see that very many things happening in dreams. The Goswamis, they saw things in dreams. Many times in dreams, certain aspects were revealed to them. The Lord spoke to them in dreams. There's plenty of that example. For example, in Keshva Kashmiri, was defeated by Lord Chaitanya, who was a mere lad. He was maybe 12 years old. And Keshava Kashmiri was the top scholar of India. All scholars would run away when he came because they were afraid that they would look like a fool next to him. So Keshava Kashmiri that proud pundit from Kashmir. He went all the way to Navadweep because he heard, oh, yeah, yeah. Navadweep is the city of learning. Let me go there and show my prowess. Yeah, yeah. So he asked, when he arrived in Navadweep, they said, well, who is really a scholar here? Who really can tell things? And somebody said, me, my pundit, opened a school on Ganga's side. Mm -hmm. If you want to meet a real pundit, he said, how old is he? Hey, maybe 12, 13 years. How can a little kid become a pundit like that? He said, well, he already opened his own school. So Keshwa Kashmiri went there. Are you need my pundit? Oh, who are you? You are the famous Keshava Kashmir. He had already heard the guy was in town, you know. Oh, this is so nice to see. Please take this elevated dice and give us something of your great knowledge. So Keshava Kashmir was pleased by the way he was received. And he started spontaneously reciting Sanskrit mantras glorifying Mother Ganga. Had, I think it was 100 verses or so he, he composed spontaneously. And Chaitanya Mahaprabhu sat there with his students and listened to Keshava Kashmiri. When Keshava Kashmiri finished and looked what kind of approval he was going to get, <coughs> Chaitanya, Nimai Pandit, taught to him, very nice, your eloquent glorification of Ganga. Just in the verse number 62, you made a grammatical mistake. And Mahaprabhu 
repeated the verse, having memorized it instantly, right here again, and pointed out to you, you see, that is a mistake. Kishwa Kashmiri was like, he was like devastated. How can this kid memorize the shlokas and then see my grammatical mistake, which he recognized it was a mistake. So he was, he was like in trance, in shock, shock therapy. Then he went to his home and dreamt. And in his dream, Mother Saraswati, the goddess of learning, appeared. And then Keshava Kashmiri asked, asked her, how can you do this? You are my worshipable deity. I've worshipped you all your life. You gave me all this scholarship. How could you allow that a, a small kid defeats me? Then Saraswati told him, Keshava, I cannot allow that you will defeat my master, my lord. This great skull woke up. He ran back to the school where Nimai was with his students. And he fell at his feet. And he said, let me become your Shishya. Some people say he became troubled and under Saraswati from that. This Keshwa Kashmir, there is not a, there are some different opinions, but one possibility. He surrendered to Nimai because Mother Saraswati in a dream told him he is my master in appearing in this world. So you can see how important the dream world is for those who are having recognition of this <coughs> and what the Lord does in the dream world with his devotees. Now you may go to sleep more excited to see what kind of dreams will happen to you. We'll show you think, well, why not? The different stages of consciousness indicate prema bhakti as being the highest. I'm now jumping the conclusion. The Vedanta Sutra goes through a great length of debates and reviews and insights and outsights until it reaches to that conclusion, prema dhamma, deva eva, nomi gola sundala. But since my time is also coming to close, I just wanted to show you how is the approach of Vedanta Sutra. This is an absolutely amazing treatise on philosophy, on spirituality, on freedom, on consciousness. It is a master school. But in a way, it is so elevated that great Acharyas have written their Bhashyas on these, on the Vedanta Sutra, their Tikas is also called commentaries, and very few people read them, because they're very intensive studies. You really have to go and sit down on your bench and not with your butt. To sit on the, on the student bench with your butt is easy, but to apply your mind to it, apply your thought to it, apply your full concentration to it, and apply your being a student to it. Because you want to study Vedanta, you have to be a student. Don't think yourself, oh, I understand everything like this. Therefore, also it has been pointed out here by uh, the author, that the Bhagavad Gita in the Mahabharata has made it a bit easier by presenting the conclusions of Vedanta Sutra. The Bhagavad Gita in no way ignores Vedantic thought and wisdom. As a matter of fact, none of the Vedic scriptures do. Walter Eidlitz, 
an Austrian devotee who was later initiated as Vamana Deva by Bhaktivedai Bon Maharaj, who be, was a great author, he wrote in one of his books that apparently the Vedas, the different books, contradict each other. And by contradicting each other, it seems they don't have a clear message. But he said, but when I approached Gaudiya Vaishnavis, all of a sudden everything falls into its place. And all of a sudden there's no more contradiction between the Vedas, but they just point at certain aspects for certain people at certain levels of consciousness. And that is <coughs> why the Vedas virtually do not prohibit anything. But they give you the freedom of decision making. Like when Prabhupada gave us the four regulated principles, no meat, no fish, no eggs, no drugs, no sex outside of marriage, no gambling. He did not give us any restriction. He simply reached to our heart and concluded all. He, he gave us the insight, the input, that these things are not desirable for us. We don't want to have them in our life. And then, we become his disciples. Not that you become a disciple of Guru that says, you are not supposed to do this. Hmm? No. And you, oh, I really want to do it, but now I can't do it because I got a Guru. No. You understand from your inner conscious drive that these things will be obstacles to your spiritual progress. And therefore, you lose all interest in them. And that is very easy when it comes to meat. It is very easy when it comes to gambling. Not altogether. Some people like to gamble in business or in doing things in life. It's also gambling. It is still quite easy but not altogether easy when it comes to intoxication. And it is definitely very difficult when it comes to the sexual drive. Because the sexual drive is so strong that to confine it into marriage and all these things is, is like some high ideal. And as you know, and that has been a question of dispute in how much a grihasta should just have sex for procreation. Because this is a sex-driven world. And we practically in our, in our philosophy, we usually, I'm talking about the last 50 years, we say, Sex should only be used for procreation, but it's privacy, but it's not sinful inside marriage. So what does it do? It means that we have an ideal which goes so high that sex can bring a pure devotee into this world. Even an avatar can come. Vasudeva Devaki made one ten thousand year lifetimes austerities to have Krishna as a son. So, my God, can you imagine getting can marry ten thousand lifetimes not having sexual relationship because you will not have it until Krishna will be your son. Well, you know, this is Veda. Veda is using extremes to show certain things. But then again, and that has been a little bit the dispute. How much can a householder have a healthy, happy family life if sex life is eliminated to the very only moment when they want to have a child? As a matter of fact, most Grihastas do not live this standard 
So they want it also to be kind of explained or they want to give some feeling to themselves that this is not all wrong. So that's why I'm touching upon this sub subject because recently in Berlin there was a larger discussion on this on the subject and uh, I was also requested to give a more insight. You see Krishna consciousness and even sex life in marriage is not really a discussion of sannyasis and brahmacharis. They should not contemplate too much about this to keep their brahmachari joy and what they're doing. Nevertheless, it is also true that those who are in the marriage, they should always live a happy life, encouraging each other, helping each other, uh, making each other feel highly appreciated. And for that reason, they may have uh, they are regulated whatever sexual connection and I would definitely say that is normal that is normal amongst devotees so if somebody has this he shouldn't feel oh I'm the worst of the sinners even though some high ideal is praised in the scriptures but we should also consider the very reality of life which the devotees live with. Then of course comes another subject. What if they still have a desire for sexual relationships but do not want to have children? And that is, well, I mean, how many children can you have? How many children can you maintain? Some devotees, some people don't have that problem because their problem is they can't get a child. They try and try and try and try and try and can't get a child. So there's a whole lot of different areas you may see. But the matter of fact is that if devotees don't want to have a child but they have not transcended yet, then if they do something to avoid having a child, even that should not be considered to be a great sin because it's kind of part of their happy family management. So I'm saying this because I've been requested to say so, but I'm also saying it because I think it's real and it's true. And we don't want any families to be in suffering or to fall apart just because they cannot figure it out how to do this in their practical life. Anyhow, I will stop that subject here. It's, it's not actually my, uh, my uh, preferred subject, as you can imagine, but... Uh, but happiness of devotees is my preferred subject. And happiness of devotees should be in such a way that they can live happy family lives and giving support to each other affectionately to be able to pull it through and to bring those children in this world and to make them grow up and who knows what comes next. Maybe one day even they take sannyas or something like that. Why not? That's what the Vedas have pointed at. That at some point we should leave behind the family attachment and just become givers of love like Prabhupada did. If Prabhupada would not have given up his family and become a sannyasi, we would not be sitting here now today. So sannyas is also a reality. And with this I end my words to give the, uh, the mic to Archie and give my respect to all the teachers of Vedanta, to all the great sages of India who have enriched 
the philosophical thought of humanity by showing the importance of consciousness, of anubhav, of experience and freedom to pursue your spiritual realization in the fulfillment of consciousness.